My name is Wolfgang Baumeister. I'm this year's recipient of the Alexander Hollander Award. I received this award for my pioneering role in the development of cryo-electron tomography, a method advancing structural cell biology. Cryo-electron tomography allows to study macromolecular and supramolecular structures in their functional environment in the cell. It combines the power of high-resolution three-dimensional imaging with a close-to-life structural preservation. It reveals the molecular architecture of cells in unprecedented detail, nowadays very often on a sub-nanometer scale. Essentially, it has created a new discipline, structural biology in C2 or visual proteomics. It provides insights into the network of interactions, <coughs> uh, of molecular interactions underlying cellular functions. Cryo-electron tomography is the application of tomographic principles of data acquisition and reconstructions to objects embedded in amorphous ice. Projection images are recorded while the object is tilted in the electron beam and the images are then merged computationally to yield a 3D representation of the object. Cryo-electron tomography brings structural cell biology to a new level. It bridges the gap that hitherto existed between high-resolution structures of individual molecules obtained by the established methods of structural biology and their organization in the context of the cell, the molecular sociology of cells, so to speak. To give you just one example of the power of cryo-electron tomography, it revealed mechanisms of the destructive interactions between neurotoxic aggregates and their environment in neurons. I'm Mazarin Banaji. I'm an experimental psychologist at Harvard University. I'm honored to be receiving the 2022 Atkinson Prize in Psychological and Cognitive Sciences uh, for what the committee regarded to be groundbreaking contributions to understanding implicit social cognition. I had no idea how, how fortunate I was to be starting my career when new methods to examine the mind became available and for one central reason, the availability of the microcomputer. Starting in the late 1970s, it became affordable for psychologists to use small desktop computers to measure what Michael Posner, the experimental psychologist, called mental chronometry, the speed and accuracy of making a response. Now, of course, this idea had been around for 100 years and we'd even been measuring things using stopwatches and so on. Um, but the microcomputer was a game changer. Without posing a question that required conscious cognition, we could now measure how long it took to make a particular response and to infer from it the semantic and even the affective or emotional meaning of words as representatives of deep concepts such as the word animal or human, strong or weak, good or bad, and, and so on. Now, all this had been done before I came into the field, and that's important. Speak about standing on the shoulders of giants. If we did anything, it was to relentlessly ask how our minds think about people as members of social categories or social groups as men and women, as elderly or young, gay or straight, rich or poor, black, white, Asian, Latinx, and so on. We showed that we can't seem to set social category aside. In other words, we were detecting a fundamental disparity between our values of fairness and equality and egalitarianism on the one hand, and the deadly reality of bias in our responses. We showed the thumbprint of culture on our brain. What may distinguish our work is that we made connections between basic work on implicit social cognition and pushed it forward in three directions, each of which involved methodological advances. With colleagues who are neuroscientists, we showed the neural correlates of implicit bias. Do the brain imaging data corroborate what we were seeing in human behavior? Second, we asked about the origins of implicit bias and adapted methods to study young children and learn how early in development implicit bias emerges. Very early is the answer. 
I'm a strong defender of support for basic research without cons any concern for whether the research will address the challenges that face society or not. Do I not care about science having positive impact on the challenges we face as a society? Of course I care. But I, like most scientists I admire, believe that the best way for science to indeed improve everything on the planet is to leave scientists free to do whatever they and other experts believe is important to study. When Heinrich Hertz was asked about the practical importance of electromagnetic waves, he said, even after giving it some thought, that it would have no practical value. Look, I'm not saying that scientists should not spell out whatever benefits of their work to society they may see. I'm simply saying that they should not be required to do so, especially by granting agencies. Our work was not only not viewed to be useful to society, it was viewed to be sufficiently dangerous that a federal granting agency was, was directed to defund it. It was viewed as dangerous enough that White House Executive Order 13950 was issued to ban the teaching of it. Now, all that said, the work has prompted a national conversation on implicit bias. It has led to a new standard by which individuals and institutions today judge themselves. I'm Dan Jarafsky from Stanford University, and I'm honored to be one of this year's recipients of the Atkinson Prize in Psychological and Cognitive Sciences. The prize recognizes our work contributing to computational linguistics and to the sociology of language. My colleagues and I study language from two complementary perspectives. We apply computational thinking to better understand human language and human society, and at the same time, we're drawing on the interactive and social ways that human language works to understand and improve machine language processing. So we build computational models to understand language. We study how these models induce linguistic knowledge from text and speech. And we look at how humans and machines do this similarly and do it differently. We also create models to help us study how meanings are expressed differently in different social situations, how meanings change over time, how computational tools can help us decipher the biases that are encoded in language. And in general, you know, how language we use tells us what we're thinking about each other. Much of our work makes use of large data sets of text and speech and neural network models. So the web is enormously increased the text and the speech and the video we have available to study my colleague, Mark Lieberman, he has this great metaphor that, that all this data and these new computational tools, it's like a new kind of microscope, a new lens for, for spotting details in the way language is structured or the social interactions, details that might've been too subtle to see before. I think our work helps point out how important it is for scholars to integrate different types of knowledge, different ways of knowing, computational thinking, psychological and cognitive models and experiments, linguistic understandings, social scientific theories. I love something that food writer Jonathan Gold said. He said, beautiful things are found in the fault lines between cultures. And I think that's true at the intellectual boundaries in science as well. I'm Harvey Mosley of Quantum Circuits Incorporated. I spent most of my career as an observational cosmologist with NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I am honored to be the 2022 recipient of the James Craig Watson Medal of the National Academy of Sciences. In 1982, I conceived of using cryogenic thermal detectors as spectrometers for energetic particles with an immediate application to X-ray astronomy. We were able to use these cryogenic microcalorimeters operating near a tenth of a Kelvin to carry out high resolution spectroscopy with unprecedented efficiency. The technique was adopted to a wide range of fields from dark matter searches to weak interaction physics to molecular and solid state physics with synchrotron light sources. The microcalorimeters have been flown in space on Dan McCammon's rocket from the University of Wisconsin to study the soft X-ray background and on Japan's Hitomi mission, which pioneered the spectroscopic study of galaxy clusters. 
A microcalorimeter-based instrument will be included on the Japanese CRISM mission, uh, opening galaxy clusters and galactic sources to high-resolution spectroscopy. The interaction between energetic processes associated with black holes and the star formation process is one of the most pressing questions in understanding the evolution of galaxies in the universe. Microcalorimeters on CRISM and Athena are unique spectroscopic tools providing detailed information on the kinematics, composition, and excitation of the very hot gas in galaxy clusters and galactic cores, opening a new window of discoveries on these important processes. My name is John Rogers. I'm on the faculty here at Northwestern University, uh, and I'm very honored to be the recipient of the 2022 James Prize in Science and Technology Integration, really recognizing our work in the development of biointegrated or biocompatible semiconductor technologies, really designed to coexist with living systems to offer a unique and powerful set of functions for advanced biomedical research and improved patient care. My core expertise is in electronic material science, and as such, I like to think about the future of electronic technologies. Now, our work focuses on completely reformulating electronic and optoelectronic systems away from their traditional rigid planar forms and their permanent operating characteristics into soft, curvilinear, physically transient devices that enable intimate integration with living organisms, thereby kind of blurring the distinction between biology and technology with really profound, important consequences for the future of biomedical research and clinical healthcare. Our goals are to establish the scientific foundations for technologies that can improve human health and enhance our understanding of living systems. For example, our cellular scale LED technologies are now in widespread use by the neuroscience community to dissect the basic operating principles of the brain. Our bioresorbable electrical stimulators serve as the basis for temporary pacemakers to facilitate recovery from cardiac surgery and as non-pharmacological means to reduce pain. In digital medicine, our skin-like wireless devices for comprehensive vital signs monitoring have been deployed in intensive care units and in remote clinics around the world, uh, with an emphasis on reducing costs and improving outcomes in maternal, fetal, neonatal, and pediatric care. My name is Drew Weissman. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and I'm receiving the Jesse Stevenson Kovalenko Medal for pioneering work in mRNA technology and vaccine development. My research furthered understanding in the scientific discipline of RNA therapeutics by changing the format of the mRNA. Prior to our work, RNA was inflammatory when injected into an animal. This led to difficulty using it as a therapeutic. Katie and I discovered that by modifying the mRNA, we could make it non-inflammatory, i.e. well-tolerated. This led to very potent and very safe vaccines that had been used in the COVID-19 pandemic. The methods that we use are broad. They include molecular biology and the production of mRNA and numerous immunologic assays, including vaccination of different animals, testing of blood for antibodies that bind to the pathogen antigen of interest and measurement of cellular immunity and challenges with live virus to determine protection. Our work helps address the challenges facing society by producing effective vaccines against the COVID-19 pandemic that have changed the slope of the pandemic and are leading to the reduction and eventual dissolution of the pandemic through induction of protective immunity in the entire world's population. Hello. I'm Katalin Kariko, Senior Vice President, 
and BioNTech, located in Mainz, Germany. And I'm also a junk professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. It is a great honor to receive the 2022 Jesse Stevenson Kovalenko Medal, along with my longtime collaborator, Drew Weissman, for our pioneering work in mRNA technology and vaccine development. Together with my collaborator, we demonstrated that nucleoside modified mRNA was non-inflammatory and very efficiently translated into proteins such as antibodies or antigens when injected into animals. Together with our colleagues, we also demonstrated that when nucleoside modified mRNA is formulated with lipid nanoparticles, it can be used to vaccinate animals against a variety of pathogens, including Zika virus, influenza virus, HIV, and SARS-CoV-2. We identified how to modify the mRNA to make them non-inflammatory and highly translatable. After discovering that transfer RNAs that are enriched in modified nucleosides are not inducing inflammation when delivered into human immune cells. Our patents co-invented with the Professor Weissman on modified uridin of mRNA was used to create the very effective and safe FDA-approved COVID-19 mRNA vaccines by BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna. Our work led to creation of a platform technology which has the potential for numerous applications, such as preventing infection, treating many different acute and chronic diseases, and gene editing. Greetings. My name is Barney Graham, and I'm former deputy director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Vaccine Research Center on the NIH Bethesda campus. I'm deeply honored to receive the John J. Carty Award for the Advancement of Science for our work on vaccine antigen design and mRNA vaccine delivery. I thank the National Academy of Sciences and my nominators for their generosity. The COVID-19 pandemic that began in late 2019 has been catastrophic, taking a toll on lives, healthcare systems, our children's education, economies, and other basic elements of our social fabric. The work being recognized by this award is related to development of medical countermeasures in response to the pandemic. This included establishing a proof of principle for structure-based vaccine design applied particularly to envelope viruses using class I fusion proteins, implementing a proactive plan for pandemic preparedness and response for select viral families, including coronaviruses, defining immunological parameters likely to be associated with vaccine safety and efficacy, and the design, development, and evaluation of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, including those delivered by mRNA. The growing human population combined with increasing mobility and changing ecologies means humans will have more contact with zoonotic and vector-borne viruses and with each other. Therefore, we will continue to experience pandemics and pandemic threats from various members of the 26 viral families known to infect humans. Our work demonstrates the value of basic research and technology development applied to pandemic preparedness and response. My name is Camilo. My name is Camilo Delellis, and I work at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. I have received the 2022 Miriam Mirzakani Prize in Mathematics for my innovative contributions to the Euler equations and the concept of convex integration. I am a pure mathematician, so I work with uh, pen and paper. In fact, lots of pen and lots of papers. And I try to understand the mathematical concepts uh, which are at the core of our description of some phenomena in the physical universe, like the motion of fluids. In my work, I have discovered some uh, seemingly 
unexpected relations between the motions of fluids and uh, the mathematical principles which govern our understanding of shapes and spaces. So my name is Amit Sahai. I'm a professor of computer science at the UCLA Samueli School of Engineering. I'm receiving the Michael and Sheila Held Prize from the National Academy of Sciences for my foundational work on the development of cryptographic software obfuscation and its theoretical applications. So the area of cryptographic software obfuscation really changes the landscape of what we understand to be within the purview of cryptography. There are many questions that previously were thought to be the domain of software engineering, which now finally mathematics has some role to play in attacking them. And that's what really excites me about um, the work in cryptographic software obfuscation. So this was really a decades long journey of investigation into this problem. And over those many years, we had to apply many different areas of mathematics and bring them in to cryptography in order to be able to tackle this problem. And uh, that involved a lot of failures along the way, many, many wrong ideas and failed conjectures uh, that we had to endure through uh, this process. But finally, it culminated in some work that uh, allowed us to build cryptographic so software obfuscation from assumptions that have stood the test of time. Software obfuscation is this very challenging problem of can we have a computer program that works exactly as it was intended, exactly the way it was designed to work, but where even when you look at the code of the program, you can't understand what it's doing. You have no idea what makes it work, and yet it still works. One of the greatest threats in society today is a lack of trust. And one way in which uh, my work can help address that is by allowing people to control exactly how much information they want to reveal and how much they want to keep private while still being useful to others. So how can I be useful to someone else in a way that uses my secrets? That's the question that we want to answer without making you reveal your secrets in the process. And that's really what my work is all about. Hello, my name is Esther Takeuchi. I'm the William and Jane Knapp Chaired Professor of Energy and the Environment at Stony Brook University. I also hold a joint appointment at Brookhaven National Lab as Chief Scientist and Chair of the Interdisciplinary Science Department. I'm being recognized by the NAS Chemical Sciences Award for breakthrough contributions in our understanding of electrochemical storage. The research that we do involves investigation of ion and electron transport. We've been able to demonstrate multifunctional materials. These are prepared by using bimetallic metal oxides or bimetallic phosphates. One of the metal centers is reduced to the metallic state on initiation of electrochemistry and creates a conductive network. This network effectively wires every particle within the composite electrode and increases the overall conductivity of the matrix. This enables two beneficial things. One, each particle is connected, so full utilization of the active material is achievable. And second, as the conductivity is very high, we can deliver high power from that composite electrode. The energy landscape is undergoing a revolution. Currently, energy is generated mostly by burning fossil fuels. But we're moving towards a landscape where most energy is going to be electricity. This is going to take place through integration of solar and wind power onto the electric grid and the widespread adoption of electric vehicles. In order for these transitions to happen for electric vehicles, clearly we need advanced batteries to, to uh, pursue these electric vehicles. Is Mary Droser. I'm a distinguished professor at the University of California, Riverside. I'm the recipient of the National Academy of Sciences Award in Early Earth and Life Sciences, the Charles Doolittle Walcott Medal for my role in advancing 
understanding of Ediacaran and Paleozoic life and environment. I work on the oldest multicellular animals on the planet, called the Ediacara biota, organisms that lived over half a billion years ago. I work largely in the outback of South Australia on a cattle station called Nilpena, on land that I acknowledge are the traditional lands of the Adna Mutnik. Today, it's a desert, but during the reign of the Ediacara organisms, it was a shallow sea. At Nilpena, we have excavated through the very hard work of many students and volunteers, over 40 sandstone beds that preserve thousands of fossils. We map and describe these fossils and put them in an ecological and environmental context. These fossils preserve the oldest evidence of mobility, the oldest evidence of sexual reproduction, a new fossil that we named Phoenicia Dorothea after my mom because of the many years she came and watched my kids while I was in the field. We have the first bilaterian, animals with a through gut and bilateral symmetry, and the oldest animal to live in the water column. These organisms lived in a world with no predators, with a seafloor covered with slimy microbial mat, much like a thick pond scum. They also appeared at a time when the Earth's climate was very dynamic. So why do we care about Earth's oldest animals? They teach us about how life evolved on planet Earth. How do animals live in changing environmental conditions? They teach us about biological processes involved with the advent of complex life. The South Australian government has embraced this amazing fossil record and has established Nilpena as a new national park so that scientists and the public alike can learn that Earth has a dynamic history that can help inform our future. Hopefully some of you can visit sometime. Hi, my name is Carrie Parch and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I am receiving the NAS Award in Molecular Biology in recognition of our contribution to the molecular understanding of circadian rhythms. Nearly all forms of life on Earth use circadian rhythms to align our behavior and physiology into rhythms that align with Earth's day-night cycle, controlling when we eat, how we metabolize drugs, and even when we choose to sleep at night. Now, we lack a fundamental understanding of the protein cogs of this biological clock and how they work together with one another to give rise to 24-hour timing at the cellular level. Our work to dissect the interactions and dynamics of clock proteins is beginning to shed light on key steps that give rise to biological timing and helping to explain how inherited changes in clock proteins alter clock timing to help make you a morning lark or a night owl. We study the structures of clock proteins using biophysical tools like X-ray crystallography, which helps us see what the proteins look like at the atomic level, or NMR spectroscopy, which help us study the flexibility of these proteins and how that's critical for their function. Together with biochemistry and cell-based assays, we can probe the clock in a complete biological context to better understand key steps that give rise to 24-hour timing. Circadian rhythms promote overall health and well-being, so having a better understanding of the molecular basis for timing will open up new therapeutic opportunities to reinforce and stabilize the clock as we age or do shift work. Now, we know that there are many clocks on Earth, from cyanobacteria to plants, fungi, and so many animals, including humans. So we hope that our work to build a molecular toolkit to study these clocks will help others join in on the fun in studying clocks as well. My name is Nancy Canwisher, and I'm a professor in MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and an investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. I'm receiving the NAS Award in the Neurosciences for my lab's contributions to our understanding of the functional organization of the human brain. This work has been done by a large number of incredibly talented young scientists who I've had the great privilege to work with. Together with lots of colleagues around the world, we've shown that the human brain is not homogeneous mush, but is highly structured with many regions of the cortex performing remarkably specific functions from perceiving faces or scenes or speech sounds to uniquely human functions 
like understanding language or perceiving music or thinking about what other people are thinking. The work in my lab has used lots of methods, but most especially functional MRI, because it gives us the sharpest picture we can get without opening the head of neural activity in normal brains as they see and think and remember. This work is most exciting to me, not for its clinical applications, because it starts to answer long-standing questions about what a mind is and how it's implemented in the brain. It's been a total blast to find little patches of the cortex that respond in very specific situations, and then to drill down with experiment after experiment to try to figure out what exactly goes on in that little patch of the brain. And along the way, this work has helped answer really basic questions like, what is the relationship between thought and language? Well, we now know that thought and language are separate in the brain. You can think a lot of different kinds of thoughts without using your language system at all. It's an awesome privilege to get to answer these fundamental questions about the human mind that people have been asking themselves for millennia. My name is David O'Bell and I'm a professor at Stanford University and this year I'm honored to receive the NAS Prize in Food and Agricultural Sciences for groundbreaking research to address challenges in agriculture and the environment. Much of my work has focused on the challenges that climate change presents to food production. While it was known that climate change presents risk, my work has helped to identify specifically the nature of those risks. For example, why periods of high temperature can be so damaging. And this work has helped to develop approaches to try to adapt systems to climate change. The main method I have used has been statistical analysis of large data sets related to agriculture, some of which come from ground data sets and field surveys, and some of which comes from satellite data. There's been a rapid increase in the amount and diversity of satellite data available, and I, along with others, have shown how useful this can be for understanding agriculture and food security around the world. My work helps to address the basic societal challenge of feeding sustainably a growing population. I think this is a really critical issue not just to reduce the suffering of people around the world, but also to help to maintain peace in the world and to help protect the environment. My name is Eddie Chang. I'm a neurosurgeon neuroscientist at the University of California, San Francisco. I am receiving the Pareto Research Award for scientific advances that have deepened our mechanistic understanding of speech in the human brain. Speech is a unique and defining behavior of our species. Our research has revealed the neural computations for speech in the human temporal lobe, the part of the brain that interprets the sounds that you are hearing right now and transforms them into words and sentences. We have discovered a rich pattern of electrical activity from cortical neural populations that represent the sounds of speech. Cells in this brain region detect and interpret complex auditory elements that give rise to not only vowels and consonants, but also prosodic intonation in speech. Neurons here also perform other remarkable computations. They integrate information about what was heard milliseconds ago while making predictions about the future. They also allow us to robustly comprehend speech when we listen to a friend speaking in a busy restaurant by filtering out all the background speech and noise. We have discovered the patterns for nearly all of the speech sounds in the English language and are currently comparing that neural code with those from brains of people who speak other languages. Parallel work in my lab has discovered the brain processing in the frontal lobes that controls our vocal tract when we speak. I'm a neurosurgeon at UCSF who collaborates with patient volunteers in scientific research during clinical brain mapping. High density neurophysiological recordings directly from the human brain provide an unprecedented window into the detailed spatial and temporal information processed in neural circuits underlying the functions of the mind. Our discoveries have redefined central questions in our field. High resolution direct cortical recordings have changed the questions from where in the brain to more mechanistic ones about how speech is processed. That is the representations in the computations are what we were really looking for. Our findings are challenging traditional models of how speech works in the human brain. 
I'm Leah Somerville, and I'm a professor of psychology at Harvard University. I'm receiving the Trolland Research Award for pioneering research on how brain and psychological development are intertwined during adolescence. Our work has contributed to a growing understanding of the nature and of human brain development and its consequences for ongoing changes in behavior, psychological functioning, and well being. My lab generally tries to draw connections between human brain and psychological functioning in several domains that are related to adolescence health. These include the development of decision making and goal directed behavior, and also emotional and social processes and well being. Our work overall has contributed to theories and has also generated tools that allow us to understand human brain development at a more mechanistic level. In recent years, we've undertaken larger scale approaches to studying brain development, which is consistent with a broad trend in the field. The need for larger scale research reflects the fact that development itself is highly complex, and there's a host of factors that influence individual or contextual variability. This means that in order to properly characterize that variability, we need to target larger, more diverse and representative samples of human participants so that the findings of our work apply to youth broadly in today's society. To this end, we've taken part in collecting one large scale project to date called the Human Connectome Project in Development, which examines over 1300 youth ages five to 21 years spread out across four sites in the United States. And this includes Boston, where I am now. We just finished collecting data, and soon all of the data will be publicly available to the scientific community for um, promoting discovery science. We hope this project will serve as a huge testbed of scientific inquiry for many research teams, and we hope this project also serves as an example for future research on the power of team-based and open science.